Hello, I'm Richard Bogan, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity entitled Hitting Refresh on Excessive Daytime Sleepiness, Managing Patients with Narcolepsy and Idiopathic Hypersomnia. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Today's CME CE activity is also eligible for ABIM MOC points. Once you complete today's program, be sure to provide your ABIM ID and birth date in the evaluation. CME Outfitters will submit your MOC points. You can also claim this activity as CME for MIPS improvement activity. So please make sure to participate and provide examples of how you will change your practice and CMEO will send you confirmation of your participation, which you can submit to CMS. So again, I am Richard Bogan. I'm president of Bogan Sleep Consultants, LLC, medical officer of SleepMed Incorporated and director of SleepMed of South Carolina. I'm also associate clinical professor at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Columbia, South Carolina, and Associate Clinical Professor at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm pleased to be joined today by Yves de Professor of Neurology and Physiology at the University of Montpellier and Director of the Sleep-Wake Disorders Center, Department of Neurology at the Guy de Chillac Hospital in Montpellier, France. Uh, welcome, Eves. I know it's very late and I slaughtered the name of the hospital, but welcome. Many thanks, Rick. I'm also very pleased to welcome Terry Weaver, Dean of the College of Nursing, Professor of the Department of Bio Biobehavioral Nursing Science in the College of Nursing and Professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care, Sleep and Allergy in the Department of Medicine at the University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, in, in Chicago, Illinois. Terry, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Rick. It's a pleasure. So I'm, I'm really excited to have both of you here and to frame today's discussion. Let's start by reviewing our learning objectives, the first of which is to differentiate the spectrum of EDS across the subtypes of narcolepsy, both type 1 and type 2. Our second learning objective is to apply data from recent clinical trials to treatment decision-making in patients with narcolepsy. And our, our final learning objective is to evaluate the impact of emerging agents for the management of EDS in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. There, there are a lot of sleepy people out there, and one of those is our first case. That This is Savannah, and I'm going to go over Savannah's presentation. As you can see, Savannah is a 26-year-old Black female graduate student. She constantly feels the need to take a nap, and she has three to four awakenings during the night, but does not have trouble going back to sleep, which is an important point. She describes very vivid dreams, colorful, almost like going to a movie. They seem real, and sometimes they are disturbing. And she often awakens with a sensation of inability to move and impending doom and panic, which she considers to be effectively panic attacks. She has no major problems except for a history of anxiety. She has had a history of anxiety disorder and diagnosed as having attention deficit disorder some years ago as she began to have some performance issues both in school and, and, and work. Her previous psychiatric evaluation was performed due to these panic attacks at night and poor concentration. She noticed irritability and mood changes with episodes of fatigue as well. Symptoms uh, actually began in her mid-teenage years, and they were slowly progressive over time. Uh, the history of vivid dreams and dream enactment uh, were also occurred and were characterized by talking in her sleep or frequent movements, which upon awakening were usually associated with the dream content. There was no history of snoring. She did not have restless leg syndrome, no history of periodic leg movements. And she also denied episodes of loss of muscle tone associated with strong emotion while awake, uh, sort of a melting sensation. Her psychiatrist had placed her on escitalopram 10 milligrams, which had somewhat improved her coping skills, reduced her anxiety. She was on methylphenidate, which had been titrated over the years to 20 milligrams twice a day. 
And she noticed that the methylphenidate had improved her memory and executive function and, and also helped with her fatigue and sleepiness. It did have some problems associated. She had a little fine tremor. She noticed some clenching of her teeth during the day and maybe some increase in anxiety on occasion with an increase in heart rate, she could feel her heart beating. In addition, she is on oral contraceptives. She had patient report outcome measures and the Epworth score was 19 over 24. As you know, 24 is the maximum. The higher you go, the sleepier you are. Interestingly, um, we recorded insomnia severity index, which in this case was 19, which is uh, somewhat elevated, which is reflected by her fragmented sleep and her sensation that sleep was not restorative. And then we have this modified FOSQ, a, a 10 item questionnaire, which uh, Dr. Weaver will talk more about later on. She scored 9.5 out of 20. We want to have a higher score here and the lower score score indicates that uh, there's some issues going on here. On exam, her heart rate's 95 beats per minute. She took her methylphenidate earlier. Her BMI is 31, which is high, as you know. Metabolic studies had ruled out hypothyroidism, anemia, and diabetes. And uh, you can see the Euro European influence on anemia. Um, her sleep diary indicated that she was typically going to bed right around 2200, maybe half, at the half hour. And she described a sleep latency of less than five minutes, but multiple awakenings in the night. But remember, she was able to go back to sleep uh, when she awakened. Her typical awake time was between 8 and 8.30, though on the weekends she would sleep in later by about an hour. Actigraphy was performed and, and basically validated uh, what she had <laughs> described. As we all know, there can be some issues uh, in terms of patient-reported dead time and awake time and patient perception. Since we're amnestic when we're asleep, we don't always know when we're asleep. She did undergo polysomnography. And at the, um, at the polysomnography, it was, um, this was a question and it was approved by her family practitioner and psychiatrist to hold her escitalopram for about two weeks prior to the sleep study. It's actually slightly longer than that. Uh, she had discontinued the methylphenidate for at least a week prior to that. And she had a video recording polysomnogram that showed a total sleep time of 420 minutes, sleep latency of five minutes. She did have some wake time in the night, had to get up and go to the restroom and had some awake time. Her sleep stage distribution, we would consider to be relatively normal in terms of uh, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. But interestingly, REM latency was 8.5 minutes. Uh, she did not have any clear evidence of obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring was really not prominent. Yet she did have an AHI of four episodes per hour, which was primarily occurring during the phasic REM episode. She had a little hypoventilation. And with her BMI of 31, she did desaturate to 88%. Her ODI was four per hour. But saturation index time was really less than one minute. Periodic leg movements were noted about 15 an hour with a PLM arousal index of 4.2. The following day, she had a multiple sleep latency test performed. She had four naps. And on those four naps, her latency on average was 3.5 minutes, and she had three sleep onset REM episodes. So, Terry, what do you what do you think? Well, I want to thank you, Rick, for, for that very interesting case presentation. But I think before we go too far, we really should get some input from our audience to see what they think is, is the situation with Savannah. And we'll reveal the results of this a bit later. Eves, I believe that you also have a case that you'd like to discuss. And, and so what is the presentation of Janet? Yes, thanks, Terry. I'm happy to present uh, the French uh, Janet. So Janet is a 23 years old white female with normal BMI about 24. There is no particular medical history, familial or personal, and no history of depression. So the symptoms is uh, quite large. The patient complained about daytime sleepiness since 10 years of age, so she was just 23, so half of uh, lifetime. She, the, the onset was quite uh, difficult to, to pinpoint with uh, really some difficulties to remember exactly the age at onset. She did have mostly a long sleep at night, and she can sleep 12 to 15 hours a day. During weekends and vacation, she, she can go to sleep around 
11 p.m. to 1 or 2 p.m. the next day with huge difficulty to wake up in the morning and she required mostly five alarm clocks. She did have rarely naps uh, because when the naps occur that take more than one hour and, and with a lot of uh, uh, problem to wake up after the naps. So mostly she, she tried to not nap. Naps were without any dreams. So sleep in nurture in the morning uh, start after the, the nighttime sleep, but also after the nap. She is never refreshed. The sleepiness is almost continuous the whole day. Uh, because of this sleepiness, but mostly the long sleep at night and the sleep inertia, she cannot uh, uh, have good performance at school and at work, arriving late uh, in the morning at, uh, at work right now and at school in the past. And all day long, she fight against sleepiness. She did have not cataplexy, no sleep paralysis, but some hallucination when she fall asleep and no real uh, agitation at night. So no argument for uh, REM or non-REM uh, parasomnia. She has no medication right now or in the past, no CNS drug, no drug uh, proposed for, for sleep. So based on clinical interview, we wanted to go a little bit deeper with some scale and we use this April sleepiness scale with uh, the score is above 10, but still not very high, uh, is 12, so around the limit. And the BDI to assess the, the depressive symptom is around 13, so not a big deal, or, or also quite in the normal range. Uh, so to, to go to the diagnosis, we decided to go to polysomnography, as Rick uh, also proposed for Savannah. And what we can see here is that there is a short REM sleep, but uh, the day after when we asked for that, she was sleepy before the recording. So it's not really a, a SOREM and that needs to be uh, in mind that when you do have a SOREM or you, you score a SOREM, you need to be sure that the patient was not sleepy before the recording. And it was the case here. The, the, the sleep efficiency was not, uh, was normal, as you can see, with uh, no uh, pathological uh, AHI or PLMS, both below five per hour. After the, the PSG, we, we performed an MSLT and with five uh, naps, and the mean was 10.8. So she, she slept all the time, but it's not very uh, uh, pathological because the, the mean is above eight. And there is no sleep on such rim period that compare, that contrasts, sorry, to the SOREM at night. So the results were in between. And because of the major complaint about long sleep at night and sleep inertia, we decided to ask for a second polysomnography with a, a long uh, recording with 32 hours recording. It's one night, one day, and the second night uh, in bed rest condition. We published that uh, several years ago in Annals of Neurology for the procedure, if you are interested to, to see. And here you can see that the patient fall asleep around 11 and 40 minutes. And after it's very hard to see when she wake up and look at the first part of the hypnogram and you need to go to the second line and she wake up at 3, 3.40. So a huge sleep, you know, with uh, around 10 cycle. After the, she has no naps, uh, there is very few complaints about naps, as I told you, just two very short uh, sleep onset. But, and after the second night is completely normal and we wake up after 32 hours of the, the recording and she was still uh, asleep. So globally, the total sleep time was more than 20 and no, no real naps. So, and the, no, the, the second night was associated with normal sleep. So there is no clearly a long sleeper uh, during the first night and no sleep the second night, as we can see without any uh, disorder. Thank you, Yves, for uh, uh, sharing with us another challenging case. Again, I'd like the audience to weigh in on what you think the diagnosis would be for Janet. So let's talk a little bit about um, the impact of narcolepsy. About 200,000 uh, people in the US 
had narcolepsy. And um, it is after sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, the most common cause of excessive daytime sleepiness seen in the United States sleep centers. On average, there's about 5% of patients um, that are seen have primary diagnosis of narcolepsy. And often it is present as a comorbid condition with other primary sleep disorders. As I've said, it's, it, it is common um, in uh, sleep apnea with 25% of the patients have sleep apnea and narcolepsy. The issue, however, is that only 82% of patients with narcolepsy receive a diagnosis after about one year from symptom onset. And a third, um, unfortunately, suffer uh, for more than 10 years before they're diagnosed. So it's very important to be able to know the signs and symptoms so that these individuals can more quickly be diagnosed and treated. Thank you, Terry. Um... There are a lot of sleepy people out there. I mean, we, we know that uh, probably 25, 30% of the adult population depends on, you know, the study design that, that people are sleepy. And, and also, you know, primary care practice, people are tired of hearing me say this, but a primary care practice has about 2,500 patients and maybe 3,000 and a third of those patients or 30% are sleepy. Yet narcolepsy is relatively rare, one in 2,000. So we have to give the primary care practitioners a break. They have a whole lot of sleepy people and embedded in there maybe one narcolepsy patient. So um, thank you for that, that uh, overview, Terry, because sleepiness has, uh, we're gonna explore the, the impact on quality of life. But, but Ease, before we get into that, can you um, talk about the neuro, why are these people sleepy? What's the difference between type one and type two? Yes, thanks, Rick. So the, the pathophysiology of NT1 is quite clear. Uh, there is a loss of orexin neurons, or also named hypocretin neurons. We do have 80,000 uh, orexin neurons in the brain, and that disappear in patients with NT1. There's a destruction with a presumed uh, autoimmune-based process because it started at a young age uh, at onset with a predisposed uh, genetic background. And because of this destruction that leads to a, a orexin deficient in within the CSF, and this is one of the biomarkers, we will come back on that in a minute. And because of this absence of orexin in the brain, that explains the daytime sleepiness, the sleep onset rem period, and the cataplexy. So the pathophysiology of narcolepsy type 1 is complex in terms of the autoimmune process, but there is a big biomarker that is really helpful for the diagnosis and is included in the ICSD3 criteria. For narcolepsy type 2, the story is less clear. And uh, there is a lot of, um, of recent data, and we, we did uh, uh, also one in my lab published in Sleep this year to look at the neurotransmitter is NT2, NT1, NIH and to look at uh, so the norepinephrine, the dopamine, the or orexin, the histamine, the GABAergic staph, and their metabolite, and it seems to be normal within the CSF. So it's very hard uh, right now to detect a biomarker with, which is associated with NT2. The two main hypotheses, the three main hypotheses is uh, imbalance between this uh, uh, sleep uh, neurotransmitter and wake neurotransmitter, but not just one in comparison to NT1. Second hypothesis in, is a partial lesion of orexin neurons, just 20% uh, of them has been destroyed, contrast to 90% of them destroyed in NT1. And the last one is circadian disturbances that may explain the high REM sleep propensity. So, and these three hypotheses are not exclusive and could be mixed together. So, so far, it's, it's more complex to be sure of the neurobiology of NT2. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so we, do, we do have a question. Uh, what happens if you have a type 2 narcolepsy patient, no cataplexy, but they're sleepy, and you do a lumbar puncture and they have low hypocretin levels? So the, the, the answer is quite clear. In this population, it cannot be NT2 anymore. I will come back in a minute with the definition, but uh, if you do a lumbar puncture in patients with, without cataplexy, in 20% of them, they will be with orexin deficient, and that need to be renamed NT1. So, gotcha. and orexin deficiency is NT1. It cannot be NT2, even if there is no cataplexy. Got it. 
But it's it's interesting. I mean, orexin um, certainly downstream excites monoaminergic amines and other regions of the brain to help stabilize wakefulness. So it has a huge impact on many body functions, uh, autonomic tone and hypothalamic pituitary axis and, and other things. But these individuals have stayed in stability, both wake and sleep uh, through this process. But now that we understand more about the neurobiology, Eves, can you tell us how that translates into our definition of uh, type one and type two narcolepsy? Yeah. So, so far since uh, seven years right now is uh, 2014, uh, the ICSD three criteria for NT1 is, as you can see on the left part, is excessive daytime sleepiness for at least three months. That is uh, unclear why it's three months because you can detect and diagnose patient with narcolepsy within two weeks, but this is what is in the criteria so far. And uh, in addition to this item E, uh, there's the item B, it, which is cataplexy and positive MSLT. So cataplexy need to be clear, and I will come back on that in a minute, what is really cataplexy. And positive MSLT is low mean sleep latency below eight minutes and at least two SRM on the five naps on the MSLT. And that may include right now also the sleep onset period during the polysomnography. So this is cataplexy and MSLT pulled together and or the low orexin measurement. Uh, and you need to standardize with the, the Stanford measure to be sure of the color value below one of the 10. Narcolepsy type two is a little bit more complex and the same criteria for daytime sleepiness, that's, that's fine. Same criteria for positive MSLT, that's fine. No cataplexy for sure, that's fine. But item D, you need to measure orexin, also name again hypocretin, and that need to be above one of the 10. So the normal is 200, so you can be in between. You cannot be below. If the question asked a few minutes ago, and if you are below, you are renamed NT1. And item E is really an issue. And the complaint, because there is no biomarker, again, there is no cataplexy, clinical biomarker, and orexin, real biomarker, you need to exclude that you, the main complaint of hypersomnolence is not explained by another condition, namely sleep deprived, OSAS, delayed sleep phase syndrome, and drug intake or withdrawal, uh, such as antidepressants stop a few weeks uh, before the, the sleep recording. So that, that's a big concern, uh, how to exclude these uh, other uh, causes that may trigger these uh, results on MSLT. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point because uh, so many of these individuals phase delay and insufficient sleep can trick us, as you well know. And we talked earlier about how many sleepy people there are out there. And you would think narcolepsy would be easy to diagnose. Someone who's sleepy and has all these REM related, REM dissociative symptoms. Um, why is it so hard to diagnose? What are some of the other diagnostic considerations? Yeah, you, you, you make a good point because uh, uh, EDS, excessive daytime sleepiness, is very frequent uh, symptoms also as Terry reported and it could be 15 to 20 percent of the general population. And here we are discussing about rare disease. So for sure, when you do see a patient with a sleepiness complaint in front of you, you need to exclude first OSA, sleep deprived, poor sleep hygiene, depression, substance and drug intake, mostly CNS drug for sure, like benzo and Z drugs. So that need to be excluded because they, these are frequent comorbidities or uh, disorder that may explain the main goal, the main symptoms the patient go to see you and you cannot think about narcolepsy just in presence of daytime sleepiness. After there is other disorder, uh, hypersomnolence disorder, namely idiopathic hypersomnia. Klein living is a different story because it's re uh, a periodic problem and you, you need to have in between episodes normal sleep duration and absence of daytime sleepiness. Periodic Lyme uh, movement disorder is is different story and you need to record sleep to be sure of the diagnosis and they are less sleepy than uh, the other condition. Circadian rhythm disorder, that's a big deal because age at onset of narcolepsy is around adolescent and young adults, and there are almost phase delay 
associated with sleep deprived because of uh, media awareness and uh, smartphone and so on. So you can see a patient sleep deprived with circadian rhythm, they go very bad uh, late uh, in the bed and they wake up very late in the morning. So uh, that, 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 that exists. And behavioral symptoms of daytime sleepiness, irritability, ag uh, aggressivity, hallucination, that may exist uh, outside of the narcolepsy spectrum. So really you need to focus on what is daytime sleepiness with number of naps, short duration of naps, dream content of naps, and to be uh, in a refreshing uh, condition after uh, being sleepy after the naps. In that need to uh, be in mind that that could be narcolepsy. So it, the presence of excessive daytime sleepiness is not enough to think about narcolepsy. You need to go in a little bit more in detail about the phenotype of EDS. And for sure, what is really helpful is to look for cataplexy because cataplexy is present in 80%, 70 to 80% of patients with narcolepsy. And it it's almost never exists outside of narcolepsy. Very rarely in orphan disease like Prader-Willi syndrome, nori disorder, but it's very rare. So when you do see a cataplexy, uh, because in front of you, because of the good clinical history or because of video type, you need to think about narcolepsy. But sometimes cataplexy is not typical and you need to think that long cataplexy above two minutes, if it's just on one side, uh, unilateral is the episode are very rare, run less than five lifetime as an example. If there is some in between consciousness during episode, if there is no trigger or just negative emotion. Mostly, if you do see that, it cannot be typical cataplexy. So typical cataplexy is a loss of muscle tones uh, triggered by strong emotion, mostly laughing. You need to go to HLA DQB 106 or two if you have any doubt. And if it's negative, it cannot be cataplexy except for extreme rare cases. But that is very helpful because it's easy to, to deal with. And if you have any doubt, you can go also to CSF lumbar puncture, but it's a little bit more invasive than the HLA. So HLA is of interest if it's negative. If it's positive, it could be 25% of the general population. So it's less helpful. But if it's negative in presence of cataplexy, it should not be cataplexy. Again, with some exception. And in front of cataplexy, you can have also to think about differential diagnosis, mainly epilepsy, hypotension, and psychogenic. It could be also a functional story. And for hallucination, when it's very uh, a huge complaint, you need to think if it's not really related to sleepiness. Sometimes the patient may complain about hallucination during the day, uh, nothing to do with sleepiness, and you need to think about psychosis, schizophrenia. And when it's at night, in the middle of the night, there is some overlap with NREM parasomnia, namely night terrors and sometimes panic attacks, depending on the content of the hallucination. Yeah, you, uh, you, you raise a good point there. But, you know, you know our patient Savannah was um, complaining of panic attacks in the night associated with sleep paralysis. So not knowing, you know, feeling of impending doom and can't move is a scary thing. So, um and, and as you well know, people who are sleepy have trouble trouble with executive function, thinking, memory, focus, concentration, mood, et cetera. Um, how does that interact in terms of obscuring the diagnosis? So yes, um, the complaint of daytime sleepiness again is very frequent and narcolepsy is rare. And an and addition problem is a delay to be diagnosed. And in Europe, we did the studies that, that still right now, it's eight years as a median to be diagnosed. So it's rare disease, but not all patients are diagnosed and with a long delay to be diagnosed. And in between, they are not diagnosed because they are misdiagnosed. And in 60% of the cases, is they are misdiagnosed with because of comorbid symptoms in addition to daytime sleepiness and cataplexy and the, the primary care uh, think about disturbed nighttime sleep, so namely insomnia, and uh, Savannah also did have some insomnia that may be disturbing for the physician. OSAS 
periodic leg movement, REM sleep behavior disorder, that may come from the narcolepsy presentation because it could be associated in narcolepsy, but it could be also a differential diagnosis. Insufficient sleep, ADHD, and also we discussed already on IH, idiopathic hypersomnia, drug intake. And, and for that, when you do see some patient with this complaint about ADHD, drug intake, and sufficient sleep, the, the, the primary care physician will think about this frequent condition may more explain the complaint. And in this condition, narcolepsy will never pop up and never think about it. Epilepsy and syncope may be confused as I discussed already with cataplexy. So three point, rarely diagnosed, so underdiagnosed, long delay of diagnosis, and a lot of other conditions that may mimic and uh, the, the symptoms, and therefore at the end, the physician think about another disorder. Excellent. Um, you know, I think um, we're getting lots of questions. <laughs> But we talked about sleepiness, Terry, and um, and while these are not diagnostic tools, they um, they give us some idea of quantifying the degree of sleepiness. Will you just dis discuss these tools that we use? Yeah, thank thank you, Rick. Because we talked about in both these cases the impact of sleepiness and these people's ability to just conduct their daily lives. And, and we need to have measures that we can use not only to look at the symptom of sleepiness, but also their daily functioning and to evaluate the impact of treatment, which we'll talk about later, um, and whether it's successful in having an, any effect. Um, I think we're all in this business to improve the patient's daily lives and not just to change their physiology. So um, we have two tools that we want to highlight. One is the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. Um, this is the most frequently used scale to uh, measure self-reported excessive daytime sleepiness. It has a four-point liquor uh, choice and eight different situations like reading, driving, um, you know, all kinds of somnolytic situations that, that could bring on sleepiness. And it can be used, I said, to monitor progress and the impact of treatment. The other is the functional outcome of sleep questionnaire, um, and uh, which I had developed. And, and it really uh, asks about how difficult is it for you to, to do a task because you're sleepy and tired. So it puts the sleepiness within a context of, of several different daytime activities. There are the FOSC 10, which is the shorter version. It's 10 items. It has test, retest, reliability, internal consistency, um, and has been used globally in randomized clinical trials and clinical practice. And there are five domains that are assessed. General productivity, which is getting uh, general work accomplished. Activity level, being able to maintain the same kind of, uh, of energy as your peers. Vigilance, being able to do those things that, that are, are certainly um, require more attention and concentration and memory. Uh, social outcomes, being able to, to socialize with individuals and, and get out of the house. And then importantly, intimate and sexual relationships, because that's also affected by sleepiness. So it's, it's important to have these tools available so that you can um, understand the impact of the disease from the patient perspective helps with a diagnosis because sometimes sleepiness may be misattributed or masked and putting it with the context of daily activities helps people think, yeah, I, I am sleepy when I do that. Um, and they're simple to administer and allows us to uh, be able uh, to monitor progression as we institute treatment. Thank you, Terry. I mean, you know, basically, is this patient sleepy and how does it affect their lives? And um, these two tools really help. And I tell people all the time, if you have a patient who's tired or a patient who's having executive function abnormality, cognition, memory, et cetera, mood abnormalities or attention deficit problems, as well as sleepy, go ahead and do the effort score and figure out whether they're sleepy or not. Because if they are, you can figure it out. And as um, Eve's talked about the differential, you can figure it out. And if you make the sleepiness better, a lot of other things will get better. But um, we've learned that people with narcolepsy do have comorbidities, which can make it um, make it difficult, you know, in terms of making the diagnosis. Will you talk about those comorbidities? Yes. And, and of course, if, if living with um, the disease of narcolepsy is not enough, um, there's also, as you pointed out, uh, several 
um, um, comorbidities that are presented. We we mentioned previously sleep apnea. This this data comes from a, a large sample of patients with nar narcolepsy versus matched controls. Um, and, and they found that um, compared to matched controls, there was a 45% increase in those who had also had sleep apnea compared to, to the controls. Um, as Eve's pointed out, there's mood disorders, um, a headache, anxiety disorders, diabetes, but also obesity, um, and then other sleep problems like uh, restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movements, and REM behavior disorder. So it's important to be able to uh, know that, to evaluate the presence of those comorbidities and know that it's going to be higher than in the normal population. And that um, also, as you treat these patients, be aware of the concomitant medications for these conditions and, and whether there's some interaction or considerations with regard to selecting the treatment for narcolepsy. Exactly. Uh, what about the cardiovascular risk? Yeah, that's important to consider also, both in, in terms of the patient with narcolepsy, but also the patient with, who presents with a cardiovascular problem that's also very sleepy. You want to think about narcolepsy in that population, but there's a, you know twice incidence of, of stroke and heart disease, um, along with 30% increase in hypertension and 50% um, increase in hypercholesteremia compared to normals. And this is from that same study. Um, and you can see that um, cardiovascular disease almost twofold without hypertension compared to normals. And if you think about major adverse cardiac events, um, again, almost twice as much. These patients also may suffer from um, heart failure. Um, we've talked about stroke, edema, um, also atrial fibrillation, uh, stroke and edema in combination. So it's really important to be able to uh, do a good cardiovascular workup to detect whether or not these are present in these individuals. Yeah, I think these are, these are interesting. And I think we have to be cautious because this is based on claims data and it's observational. So there's not cause and effect. But the point is, is our narcolepsy patients have other disorders going on. And, and they tell us that it's a burden to them. You want to explore some of the burden to, to the patients. Yeah, that's, that's very important. We know that the impact, um, especially uh, with um, hypersomnians, is that, you know, the patient just doesn't have any energy. And, and, and of course, this has an impact on others because they, they can't get up, they can't do things, and, and, and it creates in them this sense of dependence. Um, they, they really feel that, that, that when they're asked to do things that interfere with their ability to take, to take naps or to, or to just to rest during the night, they can't perform these because they're so excessively sleepy. The sleep inertia also affects their, their daily routine. And if they have to care for others, that has an impact. Um, and, and of course, there's the risk of traffic accidents with falling asleep. The individual feels about 35% have reported they, they don't have the support of family and friends because often, as I said before, um, this has gone undiagnosed. And, and, and so there's, there's non lack of understanding on the part of, of family, friends, and, and even their work community. 25% have been dismissed from their jobs because people think that they're lazy um, because they're falling asleep on their job. Um, and, and, and that's really hard for them and has an economic cost as well. They, they don't have autonomy over their work schedule, so they can't create a work schedule that will now enable them to get the rest or to be at peak uh, times of, the, of energy um, when they have to work. And so often they're working when they're the most sleepy. And unfortunately, it also affects um, their relationships with others. A 13% report that they um, either have been divorced or um, broke up with a partner because of their condition. And, and that's really quite unfortunate. And, and we need to, to be, really be cognizant of this. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think these numbers sound low to me. And when I see a patient in the clinic, they look normal. And that's, you know, they look normal to their employer. They look normal to their family until they get sleepy. So, you know, people don't always understand the, the degree of sleepiness. And so these folks do have strategies that they use um, because of this burden of idiopathic hypersomnia, as well as narcolepsy patients. Eves, you want to comment on that? Yes, thanks, Rick. So for sure, because there is no drug available, uh, 
at least label for IH, even if we use some as we treat EDS for um, narcolepsy, but the patient like also non-pharmacological uh, therapy and uh, especially they try to naps and they cannot fight against sleepiness sometimes so they are almost obliged to naps but as i um, report as janet's story the napping strategy is not really powerful compared mm -hmm. to narcolepsy because it's often very long one hour even sometimes two or three hours and they are not refreshed after the napping so they lose time because it's not really powerful and they are not refreshed so they can increase motor activity to speak all the time to try to 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 run or to to do many things you know to move uh, a little bit around to fight against sleepiness but again it's not really effective and you can try also caffeine nicotine uh, many things but uh, to to try to cope with but uh, unfortunately enough it's not again enough effective because it cannot cure and solve uh, sleep inertia and long sleep at night. It may be a little bit uh, effective on daytime sleepiness with some, uh, at some degree, but less again than uh, what we do or common for a patient with narcolepsy. Yeah, I just saw a patient last week who, who tells me that she moves all the time because if she sits down, she, she just wants to take a nap. And if she takes a nap, it's a long one and she doesn't feel good when she wakes up. So it, it can be very difficult. It, would you discuss the ICSD-3 criteria for idiopathic hypersomnia? Yes, thanks. I think that should be uh, also update uh, soon because the, the current definition of IH is based on uh, uh, many criteria on the left part. So Item E is daytime period of irresistible sleep, need to sleep or daytime lapses into sleep present for at least three months. It's exactly the same phenotype definition of EDS in narcolepsy type 1, type 2, and IH. And it's not the case for sure. Sleepiness do not have an unidimensional aspect. And there is no uh, complaint or report about sleep inertia and long sleep at night. So I think that should be update. For the item B, it's uh, less than uh, two SORMs, so it's zero or one SORMs. And again, this is an issue because when you do an MSLT with two SORMs, you can think about narcolepsy type two, as we discussed a few minutes ago. But if you redo this MSLT a few months after for many reasons, especially because the mean sleep latency is nine minutes, not below eight, and you wanted to, to do that again, and you, you, know, you did see one SORM that time and the last time two SORM or the opposite, so that, why do you need to change the diagnosis? So it's not very stable, this one, two, three SORM. So it cannot be really a definition because it's too much variable. So no cataplexy for sure. Item D is mean sleep latency below eight minutes. So that's of interest. But again, if it's 8.5, you cannot be diagnosed with IH. So what should it be? It, it is not nothing. So it, there's a complaint and MSLT is 8.5. So the eight minutes is the cutoff for narcolepsy. Is it really the main, same cutoff required for IH that need to be solved? And item two for the, so the, the D part one and two, is the total sleep time above 660 minutes, so 11 hours, uh, on a 24 hours polysomnography. And unfortunately enough, it is not available in many places all, all over the world because it's costly and the procedure to do so is quite hard. So it can be done in some labs all over the world, but many few places, but the definition is for everybody. It's international definition and is not a Montpellier definition. And if you do the wrist actigraphy, it tell you something about uh, phase delay for sure, but sleep deprived, but it's not because you didn't move that you are sleepy. So the clinophilia, the term, the term we like to use in France is you can be in a bed without any moving, but it's not sleep. So I think it's not enough. 
And item F, it's exactly the same as for narcolepsy type 2. And you need to exclude other etiology that may trigger or explain the complaint of hypersomnolence and MSLT. And the same as we discussed, sleep restriction, my HI, my PLMS, low sleep efficiency and depression, obesity, CNS drug intake. And so it's easy to, to list, but sometimes it's not easy to be sure. Uh, one example about AHI about 12, but uh, if the patient at 12, do you really believe that that may explain everything uh, of the complaint? And if the patient has PLMS about 10, as another example, that, that may explain the, the huge complaint of the subject. And same for depression, could be a consequence of being sleepy uh, and with uh, the consequences of being sleepy and not uh, formally the, the, the etiology. So sometimes, and obesity is the same, you know, it's not because you are obese that you will be sleepy. So it's easy to say to list this etiology, but it's, it's not always easy to be sure that this is mostly related to obesity or depression and less to IH per C. Thank you for that. There are uh, two quick questions on the MSLT. Um, which you've already covered to some extent. So I have a patient with narcolepsy with obvious cataplexy. I know it's cataplexy. What's the probability I'll have an, um, an abnormal MSLT or the other way, a normal MSLT, non-diagnostic? Uh, and then what do I do? And then the other is, um, you know, I have a sleepy patient with one SORAM and an abnormal less than eight minutes. Is that IH? So the first one, on a typical narcolepsy, the complaint of sleepiness and cataplexy and normal MSLT, it may be related to the age, first point, because with the age, there is a decrease in the number of SOREM and an increase in the mean sleep latency. We did publish that 10 years ago or, more or so in neurology. And so you need to stratify by the age. Sometimes there is some noise in the lab or uh, first night effect or first day effect. And or they are also uh, very anxious or stressed about the, the, the results and, and the, the diagnosis at the end. So it could be not representative one day in the lab than the day in uh, their uh, daily life. So you, in these cases, you need to redo the MSLT. Another way is that cataplexy sometimes is, uh, is not easy to be sure and you need to record that and videotype because you can say that you have loss of muscle tone when you laugh, but this doesn't mean that it exists. So you need to be sure that the diagnosis is there. So this is for the, your first point. And the second point is MSLT below 8 minutes and 1 SRM. Uh, is it IH? It is part of the definition of IH in terms of the exam, but you need to be a clinician first and to believe on the story. And the story tell you, tells you about long sleep at night, sleepiness, long sleep without dreams, with not refreshing naps and sleep inertia in the morning. And uh, the exam is just to be to confirm what you do believe with your uh, clinical interview. So it could be IH means sleep latency below eight and one, sorry, but it doesn't mean that this is IH, it's not enough. Very, very good. Thank you very much. We have lots of questions. I'm, uh, these are great questions too, but uh, we'd be better move on. Uh, this, this next slide is actually one of my favorite, uh, Eves, um, because as we begin to think about this spectrum of sleepiness and we have these patients who sound like they have narcolepsy, I call them narcolepsoid, and idiopathic hypersomnia, long sleeper types, et cetera. Um, can you talk about your algorithm that you use? Yes, yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, if it's your favorite, I can send you uh, as a <laughs> gift. Uh, so the, I think that we need to move on from ICSD3 to a, a new one because everything is not clear. What we do know is daytime sleepiness exists for these three conditions, NT1, NT2, and IH. But again, in the definition of ICSD3, item E, as I told you, is the same, but it's not the same in terms of the patient complaint, short versus long naps, uh, refreshing, yes or no, dream content, yes or no, sleep attacks, planned naps. That's differ between the three conditions. 
In narcolepsy type 1, we do see some cataplexy, hallucination, sleep paralysis, disturbed nighttime sleep, obesity, and precocious puberty. So as a complaint that is associated with this short naps refreshing with dream content. For NT2, it's less clear, but disturbed nighttime sleep, obesity is not uh, well studied, and hallucination and sleep paralysis for sure are more frequent than the general population, but less than in NT1. NIH, again, I do not like the definition within, uh, in the ICST history because they focus for the clinical part on daytime complaint but not on long sleep at night, namely hypersomnia and about sleep inertia. Agree that some patients do not have sleep inertia, you can have just daytime sleepiness. But in contrast, patients may have long sleep at night with huge sleep inertia, but not very severe daytime sleepiness. Because if you wake up at 1 or 2 p.m. in the day as uh, Janet, Yes, but there is no really time to be sleepy in the day because there is almost no day. Uh, so this is the complaint. After when you go to the exam, the MSLT, we discuss a lot on MSLT in SARM. For NT2, it is almost the same, but you need to exclude sleep deprived. So if you are sleep deprived, you cannot be diagnosed with NT2, but what is the cutoff? Is it six hours? Is it uh, is depend also on time to time and the age of the subject? And for IH, we discussed also, also the better MSLT with zero or one SRM at max and the total sleep time above 11, 12, 13. What about the cutoff? And what you can do during the 24 hours recording, can you watch TV? Can you be on your iPhone? What about the, the Lux, uh, so the, the luminotherapy and so on? So I, I, I think that need to be standardized. And also for sure, you need to exclude sleep deprived. And sleep inertia need to be also assessed objectively with uh, some uh, reaction time test, such as the sort of the PVT. So based on all of this uh, clinical exam, and um, uh, clinical story, uh, uh, clinical interview, and uh, some exam, you can go to the this different uh, disorder. So NT1 is quite clear, and we do have this nice uh, biomarker, namely Rx deficiency and the HLA-DQB10602 in 97% of the population. And in NT2, I separate some with NT2 quite close to narcolepsy type 1 because they could be with HLA-DQB10602. And I told you also that orexin may be in between decrees. You know, it could be 120 as an example. It could be 130. So in between, not normal, but in between. And some patients with NT2 may develop cataplexy also uh, later on if you are lucky enough to diagnose patients soon after disease onset. If you go in the right part, IH, you have the typical IH with long sleep time, so prolonged sleep, high sleep efficiency, sleep inertia. And when there is no really sleepiness during the day, you can imagine a, a bridge with a long sleeper that exists. You can be thin and obese, you can be, uh, uh, you know, um, tall or not, you, you can be long sleeper or short sleeper, and, and long sleeper. Cannot, you cannot sleep 12 hours a day if you work, so you will be sleep deprived. So I think there is a bridge between long sleeper and IH with long sleep time. There is the IOH which is normal sleep time, or you will be very sleepy during the day with normal sleep duration. And that is a link with NT2. And again, if you do twice MSLT, sometimes you will see one SRM, two SRM, zero SRM, three SRM, and the MSLT could be 7.5, and the other day will be 8.5. So the cutoff of eight is not enough. So there is a bridge also between IH and NT2. And what I like to go ahead and to move on, uh, and I'm happy that Rick liked that, is to find a biomarker. And if we keep on going with the current definition, we will see no biomarker for IH and NT2. And to define what is IH, uh, as Terry proposed the FOSC-10, we work on the comprehensive scale to measure the symptoms of IH, namely ISSS, that has been published two years ago in neurology. And 
this scale is very easy uh, to, uh, to, to be completed. This five, six minutes is the self-reported questionnaire. And there is some symptoms of sleepiness, daytime sleepiness, uh, sleep inertia, long sleep at night, and the consequences of having these symptoms on daily life in terms of work, social, uh, mood, so performance as a rule. So I think it's of interest to have a scale that include the three major symptoms of IH and the consequences of having these symptoms on daily life. And what we did see in this uh, in, the pa in this paper is it's contra contrast and higher for sure than normal uh, population. But the most interesting point is after being managed with drugs for IH, is the, the, the severity score decrease. So I think it's more interesting for diagnosis IH than April sleepiness scale because it didn't focus only on daytime sleepiness. Thank you very much. I, you, you know, I mean, clearly there are phenotypic differences. And as we begin to define these sleepy people on um, who they are, what they are, I mean, this scale obviously will help us a lot. So uh, Terry? Let's do a recap of our case of Savannah. As I mentioned before, Savannah is very sleepy. She has REM dissociative symptoms at night with vivid dreams and dream enactment. And in fact, um, she is so sleepy, her effort score is 19. Interestingly, her um, insomnia index, insomnia severity index is elevated because of her disrupted sleep. But on her multiple sleep latency tests, she had a mean sleep latency of 3.5 minutes and three sleep onset REM episodes. And remember, she did not have episodes of muscle weakness uh, associated with strong emotion. I'll throw it back to you for audience response. Yeah, let's see how uh, the audience has done with their diagnosis uh, for, uh, for Savannah and for Janet. So we'll start with Savannah. I'm glad that we were able to share some information that's helpful to understand that. Now, how about with Janet? Eve's mentioned that she is a long sleeper. I mean, she, look at that. She sleeps 20.5 out of 32 hours. She is sleepy because her effort score is 12. And on her multiple sleep latency test, she had a mean sleep latency, interestingly, of 10 minutes after all that sleep, but no sleep onset REM episodes. So here we have a patient who is sleepy, sleeps long hours, her multiple sleep latency tests, not particularly short, but no cataplexy, no sleep paralysis, no REM dissociative symptoms. Um, what about the diagnosis for Janet? Oh, so there's there's been a big jump in differences from pre to post. Uh, most of you um, have, have guessed correctly that it's uh, idiopathic of hypersomnia and uh, with 71% um, guessing correctly. So thank you for that. We can move forward. I think uh, we're thinking about treatment considerations. Yeah, so the, the, the main goals to treat narcolepsy is first for sure the, to treat the main complaint, the daytime sleepiness, that is really the most bothersome problem. But you need to think about the other comorbidity or other symptoms and not just to focus on daytime sleepiness. And you need to improve uh, nightmares, hallucination, cataplexy, sleep paralysis, and disturb night nocturnal sleep. And if the patient is not, uh, um, did not have enough good sleep in terms of duration and, and quality, you will be sleepy during the day. So you cannot just focus on the day. You need to focus on the 24 hours problem. But the goal is not just to manage with, uh, with drugs, it is also to improve uh, the, the knowledge uh, of the, the patient to cope with the symptoms on daily life, to reduce the psychosocial and work dysfunctioning, to improve quality of life. So that's require medication, but not only, and you need again to improve uh, the knowledge and habits and to propose some naps, rigorous schedule and so on. To improve the safety profile also, and for the patient when he's driving, as an example, and to prevent some car crash accidents, to prevent some side effect about medication, uh, to be sure that your drugs is the best for the patient as a personalized medicine, and 
of key issue, if we are lucky enough to have time, we can discuss the follow-up and the standardization to be sure that your drug is the best for the patient. You need to evaluate in the correct way. And we did also propose a scale for narcolepsy, namely narcolepsy severity scale. So I think the follow-up is a key concern and not just to diagnose at baseline and to lose the follow-up. So yeah, several drugs are available so far. Uh, and we are lucky to have a, a lot of drugs. So modafinil, armodafinil, sorry, amphetol, pitolizant, sodium oxybate, and the new one with a 92% decrease of salt. And also previous uh, old stimulants, uh, namely methylphenidate, that, that, that may be helpful for some cases, mostly some severe cases. So sorry, amphetol, we did nice uh, study in the past. Uh, with a nice randomized control trial in narcolepsy to prove that it works on MWT latency, which is really great in terms of improvement, but also on the complaint with the APRS sleepiness scale with a huge decrease of the APRS with uh, the dose, mostly with 300 milligram, which is not on the market worldwide, but is improved also with 150 milligrams. But the most important point here is that it we did publish last year and reanalyze this as a postdoc, uh, the results in patients with narcolepsy with cataplexy in one part and without cataplexy in another part. And as you can see here in the two graph, it's almost the same figure. So it works in narcolepsy with cataplexy and in narcolepsy without cataplexy. It's not named type one, type two, because also there is no orexin measurement here. So it's mostly based on the complaint. And in terms of the PGI, we do see almost the same. Uh, the patient improve in, a, in a, almost in the same way with cataplexy or without cataplexy. So the drugs is really, uh, really helpful for sleepiness, for a patient global impression uh, in the two groups with cataplexy and without. This is the take home message. Excellent. A new drug. Um, there and then uh, efficacy on the work productivity and narcolepsy. Terry? Yeah, um, thank you. And then that same study that that um, Eves mentioned the, it had four arms, a placebo and three do doses, and uh, was a 12 week study, randomized controlled trial trial and, and patients were had excessive sleepiness. And as you can see here, when they looked at, at work productivity, um, that there was a profound dose response between um, and several outcomes uh, between the doses. Uh, the dark line is the placebo, and then the, the turquoise are the three different doses. Uh, the higher doses, there were more impact, and that is the 150 and 300 milligrams. Now, work present, presentism, as we say, uh, impairment, uh, was improved at those higher doses. And that is um, the ability to actually conduct the work when you're there. Um, these patients uh, don't have a high level of absenteeism. That was not found in this study. It's more that they just can't get the work done. And when they looked at the overall work impairment, you can see, again, a very nice dose response uh, where, again, the higher doses um, had a greater impact in improving just the overall improvement in their work. Excellent, Terry. In addition to solar amphetol showing efficacy and improving work performance, as you can see here, solriamphetol also improved functional status as measured by the FOSQ-10 or modified FOSQ. And what you see is over this period of time, you see the placebo group and then solriamphetol at different doses and it separates out. So the impact of excessive sleepiness and then the impact of treating excessive sleepiness on functional outcomes is very apparent uh, looking at this data with solriamphetol. I should note that uh, there is a graph of 300 milligrams. The FDA did not approve 300 milligrams, but uh, it did approve up to 150 milligrams. So remember that. But uh, Terry, can you discuss, um, you know, your your interpretation of the FOSQ10 and clinically meaningful changes? 
Yeah, so in, in this, again, it's the same study, um, and data was pulled from actually two studies uh, that, that, that looked at solreamphetol, and um, there was a dose response for the FOSC-10 in solreamphetol, um, and so it improved daily function, but the question is, what's important, what's clinically meaningful? And so in, in this analysis, there were several different ways that that was examined, um, ROC curves, uh, 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 correlations. Um, but the one that I'm presenting here is the mean change in both the patient global impression of change and the clinical global impression of change. And as you can see, when you go across the table, um, that uh, even for the minimally improved, there was a two point increase in the FOSC-10 um, relative to the change that was noted uh, by the, the clinicians as well as the patients. And that's shown in the lower graphic as well. As you move from very much improved to, um, to much worse, there's a really nice step down um, related to the change in the FOSS. So we concluded in this publication that um, the minimally important difference is about two points improvement increase in the functional kind of sleep questionnaire. Excellent. Um, so, Eve, let's move on to Pitolosan. Yes. So, Pitolosan, as you know, has been uh, uh, reported many years ago in uh, several randomized controlled trials to see that there is an effect on daytime sleepiness and on cataplexy in NT1 and NT2, also for sleepiness. And this recent, recent data uh, uh, reassessed the same uh, data from these two randomized controlled trials in um, focusing on the population, the most severe one with a prostipiness scale above 16, with MSLT, sorry, uh, mean sleep on MWT below eight minutes, and also the weekly cataplexy rate above 15 uh, per uh, two weeks, so at least one per day. So it's the question asked was in the severe population, does uh, pitolizon is really helpful. So if you do see the results in this pop severe population of sleepiness, uh, there is a decrease of the APRS from 19 to 13 in the APRS sleepiness scale uh, with the pitolizon and three points decrease in the control, so in the placebo group. And if you look at the objective measurement on the mean sleep latency, you increase a lot from three minutes to 10 minutes with the pitolizon and three minutes only for uh, the placebo. So it, it works on the severe population. And if you go for the CGI, it's improving also uh, in the same way for uh, CGI for EDS, uh, with the placebo, uh, with the pitolizon improvement compared to those with the placebo for uh, sleepiness assets with the ES ESS or with the MWT and the CGI for cataplexy is also really improving with the pitolizon compared to the placebo. So the we and the finally the weekly cataplexy rate improve uh, so decreased for sure in this way of reporting the results with the pitolizon with stable uh, results with the placebo. So the, the, this postdoc analysis is of interest to see that it works also in the more severe subject. Excellent. I mean, this is you know, through histamine. We've got some really neat data coming up. Uh, so be patient. This particular study design looking at the lower sodium oxabate preparation in narcolepsy was a maintenance of effect trial. So we took patients who are on sodium oxabate, other anticataplectics. You can see the subgroup there, but we treated them to effect, basically, so open label titrated them to effect or tolerance, and then captured a, a stable dose period, which is our baseline. And then we randomized them to continue drug or go to placebo. And we, and we asked the question, are they sleepy? Do they get sleepy again? Or do they have return of cataplexy? And basically, what you see is that there's a difference. The ones who were randomized to placebo actually got sleepier compared to this stable dose period. So again, a signal that these individuals were less sleepy on this lower sodium oxabate uh, preparation in the treatment of narcolepsy with cataplexy patients. And the other uh, is from the lower sodium oxabate preparation efficacy, looking at SF36. Uh, uh, Terry is going to obviously be interested in the quality of life measures. 
we saw the quality of life in these individuals significantly uh, were improved in the lower sodium oxalate preparation. Part of the way of looking at this is the, uh, the efficacy of cataplexy free days uh, over, over a, a week calculation. And you can see as we titrated these subgroups and, I, and because of time, I, I want you to go back and study this more, but look at these subgroups uh, in naive patients, other anacataplectics, sodium oxabate with uh, anticataplectics or alone transitioned over to the lower oxabate preparation up to that stable dose period. And you can see that they move up to close to six days of cataplexy free days during that time. So this is uh, the two exciting results based as you just reported on low sodium and right now here on once nightly sodium oxybate. This is not yet published uh, uh, data. So, but uh, this is what we will report uh, in the Congress here, uh, sleep Congress. So it's two parallel groups, one with the placebo, the other one with this uh, uh, FT218 uh, and with escalating dose starting at 4.5 to 9 grams again once nightly. And there is a two primary endpoint. This is a 12, uh, 13 weeks uh, 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 trial. And as you can see here, at the primary endpoint is the MWT, and it improved a lot uh, till uh, 10 minutes. Uh, compared to the placebo improving for 4.5 uh, minutes. So there is uh, differences, significant differences in the MWT sleep latency improving with the once nightly. And the secondary endpoint was the cataplexy for sure with the same uh, assessment as we discussed, the weekly cataplexy attacks that decrease a lot uh, with the drugs uh, minus uh, six uh, com uh, per weeks again com uh, at the end of the trial and minus five in the, the placebo, which is quite large for the placebo after 12 weeks. And what is uh, of interest, as Rick reported, is uh, the interest of the week, um, the the cataplexy free days, it is another way to, to report as we often do for epilepsy is the day without any cataplexy. That, that is of interest and should be also assessed with this FT218. Thank you, Eves. Let's discuss some special considerations for these therapies. As we know, modafinil or modafinil are metabolized through the liver, through the uh, CYP system and it is a mild inducer of those enzymes. So as a result, hormonal contraceptives are metabolized through the same mechanism. So it can decrease the effectiveness of hormonal contraceptive agents. And because it does promote wakefulness and may slightly increase sympathetic tone, we have to watch for heart rate and blood pressure in these individuals. Methylphenidate is a schedule two drug, uh, can have increase in sympathetic activities. So we can see individuals have uh, nervousness, anxiety, tremor, and of course, increase in heart rate and blood pressure. And it does have abuse potential. So these individuals have to be monitored very closely. So Riampetol is interesting in that it is excreted through the kidneys. So it has uh, no effect on the CYP enzymes. So there's no drug-drug interaction related to the CYP enzymes in the liver. As a result, we don't have to worry about uh, birth control pills in, in these individuals. We do need to know renal status. Um, we do, uh, like all wakefulness promoting medications, have to monitor heart rate and blood pressure because there could be an increase in heart rate and blood pressure in some patients who are exposed to soriampetol. Interestingly, it is a schedule four, but has low abuse potential. And in fact, when compared to fentramine, um, it was less than or equivalent to fentramine in terms of abuse as far as uh, recreational drug users in terms of that measurement. And remember, the 300 milligram dose is not available in the U.S. But tolosan's interesting because uh, it does have hepatic metabolism, and we have to take into account QT intervals if we have a drug that um, has some inhibitory effect on the 3A4 system, might increase the drug exposure to patolosant. Otherwise, not much too, not too much concern. It's not a scheduled drug. So this is, a, this is amazing. We now have a wakefulness promoting medication 
that works through histamine and it's not scheduled. The sodium oxalate uh, preparation, as we said, is uh, when you're on nine grams, you get about 1.6 grams of sodium and it is a CNS depressant. And as Eve's pointed out with all these drugs, we wanna monitor any CNS uh, side effects because they're always outliers, patients who may have mood disturbance or other issues with these drugs beyond the headache, dizzy, nausea thing that we see. The lower sodium oxalate, pretty much the same side effect as the sodium oxalate, but it's 92% less sodium. So that's important in their individuals who may have co comorbidities. Uh, so Eves, our patient Savannah, who has type two narcolepsy, I think some of you thought she had type one, but she had no cataplexy. Um, would you discuss uh, your treatment considerations in her? There is a lot of uh, possibility right now, and uh, and that's good news. And um, we need to go to personalized medicine for uh, not to treat at the first line narcolepsy with one drug, and uh, if there is a failure for efficacy or safety, we need to go to the second line. Now, we need to discuss at the first line which is the best for the patient in terms of the severity, in terms of the comorbidity, and the safety profile. So a few examples here. For LXB, it's nice for severe cataplexy and disturbed nighttime sleep and obesity if there is no sleep disorder breathing because LXB may uh, work on that. And uh, for moderate EDS because mostly we could be not enough for severe EDS. And, and uh, with some concern about comorbidity about cardiovascular effect. For pitolizon, it's moderate EDS and moderate cataplexy. And it's nice for the patient with psychiatric problem, depression, and cardiovascular past history because there is no interaction with, but sometimes it's not enough, so it's why it's called for moderate symptoms. So the omoxibate is mostly the same as low so omoxibate, except for the comorbid cardiovascular disease. We want to not propose sodium oxibate in this condition, especially CVI hypertension, but for LXB, you can cope with. For modafinil, it's really effective drugs. We know these drugs for decades. It's a French drugs. And uh, so it's effective for severe EDS, but not really for cataplexy. But you need to be uh, cautious about uh, uh, blood pressure, especially a cardiovascular risk. For the sorreamphetol, it's very important drugs for severe daytime sleepiness. It's really effective on MWT. Uh, but for cataplexy, there is no key effect, and you need to be sure about the safety profile for cardiovascular risk that may increase the dose, uh, increase the blood pressure, but especially with the 300 milligram, which is not on the market. And for methylphenidate, it's of interest for resistant cases for the because it's scheduled uh, drugs, schedule two. So you can propose that for very severe and resistant patient for sleepiness, but it's of interest also because of this oral contraception and modafinil is contraindicated for that. Thank you, Yves. Um, it's nice to hear from the learned clinician uh, these, these, these results. We have some treatment considerations uh, for Janet and, uh, and some really important information here New data, uh, quite frankly. So, Eves, would you discuss uh, treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia? Yes. Yeah, so, so far, it's quite clear because we uh, treat uh, EDS in IH as we do for narcolepsy because there is no drug specifically approved for IH. But unfortunately enough, with the current drugs, we cannot treat long sleep at night and sleep inertia with the modafinil, the methylphenidate, the pitolizant. And for the sodium oxybate, we will discuss on that in a minute. And for the claritromycin, I have no personal experience. It's based on the in-between results, I may say. So I, but I, I have no personal experience, so I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't try. As we look at the, the trials that have been done, I mean, there have been a number of trials. Most of these are investigator-initiated trials, but this is here for your reference to review later on. And, uh, and, and for your review is a, a brief uh, bit of data on modafinil and looking at the efficacy in the idiopathic hypersomnia. But as I said, most of these are investigator initiated trials, but we have a trial um, looking at lower sodium oxalate. And this is a, a very nicely done, very similar to the narcolepsy trial where we took patients uh, and again, titrated to effect with lower sodium oxalate. So these were patients with 
uh, that met ICSD three criteria of idiopathic hypersomnia, we treated them to effect or tolerance. They reached a stable dose period, and then we randomized them to lower sodium oxalate or placebo. And now we get a chance to look at these. These are hot off the press. These are mostly based on abstracts that were presented at some of the society meetings. So um, this is brand new data, Eves. Yes, I think the, the, the design is very uh, well uh, deserved to answer the question asked. And it's complex as you reported because there is several arms, but the major uh, end point was to compare before the randomized uh, withdrawal period of two weeks uh, after the stable dose of taking low sodium oxybate for many weeks, depending on the dose and if it's once nightly or twice nightly. And after stable dose, they go to the two weeks randomized withdrawal period uh, for placebo for half of them and to continue with the drugs intake for the two weeks again. And here, there is one of the primary endpoints. This is the primary endpoint is the aprosleepiness scale. And as you can see with the low sodium oxybate is decreased with the open label study and is stable in the stable PERT study. And at the end of the trial in the group that continue the drugs, it's stable around seven and it was 16 at the beginning, and it go up to 14, so in the group randomized to placebo. So really, it's effective on this uh, complaint assessed by April sleepiness scale. Thank you, Eves, for discussing the primary endpoint on the efficacy of lower sodium oxalate and idiopathic hypersomnia. Now, I would like to talk about some of the key secondary endpoints. One of those is the patient global impression of change. Remember, these individuals were titrated to effect, reached a stable dose period, and then double blind were randomized uh, to placebo versus lower sodium oxalate. And when you look at the, the outcome measures, when these individuals blinded uh, were on placebo, they got much worse. So look at the percentage of patients who were very much worse, much worse, or minimally worse, 88%. Compared to the lower sodium oxalate group, you can see 21%. So a big statistical difference in that the individuals on placebo clearly worsened after just two weeks of therapy. Again, showing efficacy of lower sodium oxalate in patients with um, primary hypersomnia. Another way to look at this is uh, this new scale, and which has been very effective in terms of assessing symptoms in these individuals. So this idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale, when you look at baseline measurements, you can see that these individuals were significantly impaired. And as they were titrated over time, you can see that this uh, scale decreases. So the individuals had less impairment then you reach the stable dose period, and then the individuals were randomized to placebo, blinded, versus continuing on lower sodium oxalate. And what you see is that the individuals worsened when they were placed on placebo. So this secondary endpoint shows that in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, when placed on placebo, uh, after two weeks, did show a statistical difference in terms of the severity of their symptoms. They actually worsened. Another way, to look at these individuals is the visual analog scale. This is a, a very interesting way to look at excessive sleepiness in these individuals with idiopathic hypersomnia. As we know, some of them are long sleepers. Some of them have a hard time awakening in the morning. They complain of sleep inertia. Their brain is just so sleepy and tired. And in fact, they have this sort of sleep drunkenness sometimes, or sometimes even confused are set multiple alarms. So this is a way for us to actually examine how easy it is it for these individuals to awaken in the morning. So you have this 100 millimeter scale and how hard is it for you to awaken in the morning? And you can see this baseline point here of around 54 in these individuals. And then as you place them on lower sodium oxalate, you can see this really reduces down statistically significant. There's a signal here that says these individuals can awaken more easily. And then you go into the stable dose period and what you can see, again, blinded, the lower sodium oxalate group remains stable. They can still awaken more easily in the morning compared to the baseline state. But when you look at those randomized to the placebo group, you can see there's a worsening. 
So using this visual analog scale, we see that individuals who were randomized to the placebo group worsened in terms of their ability to awaken in the morning. I know you um, are a primary author, and this will soon be in the peer-reviewed um, literature as an article, with it, and, I, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And um, so this data has been published in abstract form, and some of the data is actually at the APSS meeting now. So check it out and get, um, uh, get some more information. This is really exciting, randomized, large study in idiopathic hypersomnia, recognizing that we do not have current drugs approved by the FDA. So let's conclude. Uh, the diagnosis of narcolepsy type 2 and idiopathic hypersomnia is challenging, as uh, Eves has pointed out. And it's laden with misdiagnosis, uh, misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, and considerable diagnostic delays. And treatment options for narcolepsy have expanded and include therapies. Hopefully, we've had a chance to cover some of those today, so you can uh, look at that and may be ideal in patients with medical comorbidities, particularly in terms of the lower sodium exposure. While there are currently no FDA approved therapies for IH, lower sodium oxalate may soon be the first agent to be approved, which is pretty interesting. Why does this drug work is another story. I mean, in terms of taking it at night and these sleepy people. When making treatment decisions for narcolepsy and IH, therapeutic efficacy on quality of life and functional outcomes must also be considered as Terry mentioned. As treatment outcomes are not stable, follow-up is really important. Um, Terry, Eves, this has been a great discussion. I mean, this we could keep on going. Do you, do you have any other uh, thoughts that you want to make before we move on? No, I think we've uh, been pretty thorough in covering this. <laughs> I, I hope that the audience benefited. Certainly, we've seen um, that we've uh, initially had uh, some impact on their understanding of both narco narcolepsy and, and idiopathic hypersomnia. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Now, just to say that we need probably one or two hours again to cover the wool topic, which is a complex topic, but it, it's 2 a.m. almost for me, so it's also, also late. <laughs> now, you're, you're our hero. So, uh, so let's wrap it up with these SMART goals. Utilize evidence-based strategies to improve the differential diagnosis of narcolepsy and IH. Assess a patient's daytime sleepiness at each visit. Assess the impact of treatment options on quality of life and functioning facilitated by patient-reported outcome measures, such as the Epworth, the FOSQ, and the IHSS. Now we have uh, idiopathic hypersomnia scale. Consider patient-specific factors, such as cardiovascular risk when making treatment decisions for patients with narcolepsy or IA. To receive CME CE credit for today's program, complete the post-test and then click on the request credit tab to complete the evaluation and print or download your particular certificate. Uh, visit the Sleep, Sleep Disorders Hub, Sleep Disorders Hub for additional activities on sleep disorders as well as resources, animations, and patient education. And again, I would really uh, very much like to thank Terry and Eve for an unbelievable discussion and all the work that they do for the patients with sleep disorders and Eve's is a hero staying up so late in France. And of course, uh, I would like to thank you, our audience for participating and providing the best care for your patients. So take good care. Thank you very much.